Investors Chronicle. Welcome back to the Companies and Markets Show. It is Thursday, the 26th of January, as we record. Uh, delighted to be joined, well, by, by a bumper edition of people this week. Uh, we've got Hermione Taylor in the studio. Hi, Hermione. Hello, thanks for having me. Alex Newman's in the studio. Hello, John. How are you doing? Very well. Over the air, we've got Mark Robinson. Yes, I'm here again, John. Julian Hoffman as well. Hi, Julian. Hello, John. How are you? And Arthur Sans, are you there? Yeah, I am. Hi, John. Just about, apparently. Uh, a bit reluctant. <laughs> and uh, Dan Jones, of course, hosting everything. What are you doing with this this lot today? Well, we are starting with pubs, perhaps befitting the large number of us. Uh, a few trading updates this week. Uh, so we're going to talk Weatherspoons, Marston's, Phil and Smith and Turner. Then we are going to discuss our cover story with Hermione, who's written it. It's on quantitative tightening. And finally, we are going to talk about a few of the big stories in the world of US tech, uh, job cuts, AI developments, and some problems for Google as well. Lovely. Well, a flavour of the IC's companies coverage before we get on to that main part of the show. The CEO of British oil and gas company Capricorn Energy was among seven board members to resign following a battle with activist investor Palliser Capital. Uh, Palliser holds nearly 7% of Capricorn shares and were strongly opposed to the planned merger of Capricorn with the Israeli natural gas group New Med Energy. Alex Hamer has the write-up for the IC on that one. Primark owner Associated British Foods enjoyed record clothes sales in the week to Christmas Day as strong footfall boosted performance. Retail sales were up 18% against last year for the 16 weeks to 7th of January. EasyJet shares jumped 10% on Wednesday morning after the airline said bookings in the last three months of 2022 were strong, up 47% from the previous year. The company still made a pre-tax loss of £133 million for the quarter, but again, that figure is substantially better than the year before. Michael Fahey with that one. Uh, and meanwhile, Wizz Air and Jet2 were also upbeat, with both companies noting the boost to passenger numbers in Q4 versus the COVID hit 2021. Wiz reduced operating loss by 27%, while Jet2 beat analyst expectations for its financial year to March. Tonic specialists FeverTreat shares, on the other hand, fell 10% on Thursday after the company warned about increased glass prices. Management said it expects energy price inflation to add £20 million to glass costs this year. And Chris Akers with the write-up on that one on the IC website. And finally, Tesla is dropping the prices of its cars to boost demand. Boss Elon Musk said the company could sell 2 million cars this year, which would be around a third more than last year. Tesla's share price fell over 50% in the last six months or so, but did jump 8% on Wednesday after the company's Q4 revenue also increased. That's all from me. Back to Dan and the rest of the show. Thanks, John. Yeah, so we'll start with Pubco's three trading updates this week from pubs and their ilk, Marston's, Weatherspoon's, Fuller, Smith & Turner... And fairly disparate set of figures, it's fair to say. Uh, the pre-COVID comparators are particularly notable, I think. Uh, if you look at like-for-like like sales, albeit all for slightly different periods. Marston's up 5%, Weatherspoon's down 1%, Fuller, Smith & Turner down 5%. Uh, so, as ever, company-specific analysis is crucial. Mark, I know you have some thoughts on the pubcos and on these trading updates in particular. Why don't you take it away? Yeah, sure. Just some, um, just some sort of quick takeaways from it. With, with Weatherspoon as well, that uh, deterioration compared to the um, pre-COVID uh, comparator, that was probably more severe than you think it is because you've, you know, we've been passing through an inflationary, uh, a high inflationary period uh, subsequent to that. So that uh, that reversal is is perhaps even a little bit greater than you might think. Um, Marston's was the pick of the bunch, I guess. They they said that they had enjoyed a, a, a decent Christmas period uh, with sales up by around 12.9%. Um, uh, but they all, of course, pointed to um, the difficulties with uh, cost increases uh, across the sector as well. Um, and 
that 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 will probably only increase as we go forward because I've I've read different estimates on this, but uh, uh, the, the latest piece of research I had saying that uh, London pubs and and restaurants uh, could be facing an energy rise of about four and a half grand when the government pulls or at least reduces its support measures uh, in the spring. Um, and there was a parallel research from the the Chamber of Commerce as well saying that uh, just about nearly half of uh, UK firms are expecting uh, a fall in profitability uh, in the in the coming months again largely down to energy costs so that is that is the the main hurdle facing these companies at the moment Tim Martin um, went on to say that uh, well it, he sort of reiterated uh, his mantra about the um, sort of uh, the the tax treatment of pubs in relation to the supermarkets and it's a valid point that uh, when you think that supermarkets have picked up about half of the pubs uh, beer volume since 1979 uh, they they're they not treated on a like for like basis with tax as well and he's, he's made this point time and again and he actually expressed some dissatisfaction that other industry leaders or other uh, prominent figures within the hospitality industry haven't uh, joined him in uh, the critique uh, of the government on this basis. So I guess we can say that there's 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 good signs. Uh, sales are, are are heading in the in the right direction, broadly speaking, but they're still uh, well short of the pre-pandemic comparators. Yeah, on uh, uh, Tim Martin's comments, uh, food sales, I think, were particularly in his uh, 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 sites again, you know, in terms of supermarkets paying zero VAT on food sales in comparison with pubs. Um, and energy, as you say, is a big issue. I, I think you, we should note as well that uh, some of these companies have hedged these costs for a year or two as well. Marston's, I think, has got electricity costs hedged. For uh, this year, gas prices hedged to 2025. It says Weatherspoons may be similar, but but equally, you know, the, these hedges will need to be renewed, even if the prices themselves may have changed in a few months' time. So certainly something to keep an eye on. Uh, Alex, I know you had some thoughts on pubs as well in general and recent fortunes. Yeah, I'd, 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 I mean, it's just a couple of things um, that, I mean, following, following the sector the last few years, it, it's, it's obviously incredibly hard one in which to make money now so i mean of, often the you know the news cycle will focus on sales in the you know various periods and how seasonal trading is affected um by you know major sporting tournament success or the weather or strikes or whatever it is um but i, I mean it's it's profits which really count for these businesses um i mean as mark mentioned marston's yeah the, the pick of the bunch there they they I think this year their their operating profit margins are forecast to be about sixteen percent, which is quite uh, far ahead of. I mean, it's, it's nearly double Fuller's and almost triple Weatherspoons. Um, but you know, these are also companies with you know pretty large borrowing piles and and big tax bills, as as we also talked about just then. So you know, at the net margin level, things are you know they're really weak. It's like Marston's four point four percent. Um, expected net margin this year, Fuller's three percent, and JD um, Weatherspoons is one percent. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think when you when you look at uh, you know trading updates and sales figures that which get put out, like the the market can react quite strongly, you know, one way or other because it's all about hitting or missing expectations. Um, but I mean, the news cycle, like management excuses, can get a little bit myopic, really. And I, I think there are so many. There are so many factors um, in the sector, which you know, from changing tastes uh, to you know, uh, like an arguably unsupportive tax regime, higher prices, fewer younger drinkers, etc. Which, which just mean that the you know, it's not really the reliable um, bet that that pubs you know that pubs once were. And uh, you know, I, I mean, my, my my view on on the sector is just, it's just you know there. Are, deep questions about its longevity and as a reminder of that you just you only have to look at pub numbers in in absolute terms over the last decade have fallen 15 percent and that's not an industry that's exhibiting growth and you can tweak the product mix you know as weatherspoons has, has done quite well over the last few years but it's it's a really hard 
business to make money from. Um, and that's really what investors should pay attention to, not how, you know, not how well sales do, you know, over a two week period of particularly important trading um, is my view. Yeah, I think I think with uh, as you talk about trading and, and perhaps the the uselessness to an extent of some of those figures is exemplified by the way management talks about them, you know, Fuller's blame strikes for its yeah. drop, whereas Mitchell and Butler's to give another example, fairly similar type of business, uh, you know, saw distinctly better figures despite those same strikes. So it exactly, goes to yeah. show you can't take perhaps that much from from these figures. But but in terms of the structural trends, perhaps, I mean, uh, cost of living crisis, obviously something we bring up every week for obvious reasons. But Weatherspoons is a company that has had a lot of success share, share price wise and operationally for years. It is targeting that particular demographic. I mean, do we think that is a positive or a negative at the moment? Positive, perhaps you might think people might down trade to Weatherspoons, but perhaps the brand doesn't lend itself to that. Perhaps actually you're going to have bigger pain for your core customers so i don't know mark well i think of you well i'm i know i'm glad you came over to me with weather spoons and <laughs> i might well be the the core demographic there but but there is um reason to think as well that uh, millennials and gen z just don't uh, see the pub in the same way that well my my generation did growing up um and i think alcohol sales uh, in that cohort are, are certainly down too. So as Alex says there, says there that uh, that may be a, um, equate to a structural problem uh, over the long term as well. It also, may, uh, it, it just may be difficult uh, running a pub co given the number of branches, uh, uh, you know, within your control too. We know that uh, Weatherspoons is hiving off some of their outlets, outlets. And I guess when you've got wider wider changes that are uh, beyond the, the control of management than having this great large number of large number of pubs becomes that much more of a problem really and but I, I don't think we can get away from costs this time around to uh, the, the point that John made earlier about um, Chris's write up for fever tree then uh, they haven't been immune uh, to uh, cost pressures even though they've got this uh, capital light business model um, so I guess we'll probably have to wait until this time next year, assuming there's no more uh, pandemic link disruptions to get an idea of exactly uh, what's been happening. I think definitely just to jump in there, I mean, trends are, tra are changing quite quickly. I mean, Arthur can tell you about uh, Hollywood Bowl and I mean, that business is doing really well. And there seems to be a, a definite move towards uh, that kind of leisure activity and preference to going out drinking. I was certainly in the local area. I was telling the other day that all the pubs have closed. So uh, it, it, there's definitely there are there are changes. There are sort of under under uh, changes under uh, underlying all this that are, are definitely social in in nature. And I mean, Tim Martin always has the same. You know, every year it's the same song that he sings about taxes and you know the state of his business. Um, but you know, if, I mean, how many how many times have how many how many campaigns are there now to stop the local landmark being turned into a weather spin? That's another um, it's another social thing that's changing as well. That people are now seeing that as a negative on the high street rather than you know a business that took over the local bank. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, times are changing. Uh, one other thing on on trade off trade, Mark, you talked about Fever Tree. Diageo also had an update out this morning. I mean, there's only kind of read across there that you, from what from um, you're looking at. A little bit different. I mean, I, I spent a little bit of time um, writing about their competitive moat, really. And um, even though the shares were marked down, uh, they were marked down considerably last time. I looked between five and six percent. I don't know what it is now. But it's it's the fact that um, you know they, when you when you look at the business itself, it's got it's got genuine pricing power, and that's what you need during uh, like a situation we're going through at the moment, and uh, that's that's evident in their in their average uh, cash flow ratio as a proportion of sales over the last uh, five years, and I also highlight the uh, average return on equity that that's very strong too. Um, it's got a prime position in a number of the largest um, uh, spirits, that, well, products that sell um, 
you know, an extraordinary amount of uh, spirits. I I looked up today the Johnny Walker brand, for instance, that that accounts for about a fifth of uh, Scotch whiskey sales across the globe too. So they've got all these sort of inbuilt uh, advantages, Diageo, and it's difficult to sort of come up against them uh, as a competitor. Um, the sell the sell off was um, linked to softening uh, demand in in the US or uh, the prospect of uh, further softening demand in the US. Um, but it, the, 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 the group as well, it, it's benefited over the period because of this um, uh, premi premiumization strategy. Uh, I can't, I hate the word as a, in addition to not being able to pronounce it, but, 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 but it's, the, the, the thinking is that even during economic downturns, you know, people are actually willing to spend a little bit more money on life's little luxuries, and there's plenty of evidence to back this up too. So um, there's a read across in terms of price pressures, uh, but beyond that, I think Diageo is in a much stronger place than the pub codes themselves. Yeah, makes sense. Let's uh, move on now to our cover story this week, which is on... The end of the QE era, or potential end, and the beginning of the quantitative tightening phase of uh, economics of markets and, and, and the impact this might have. Uh, Hawani Taylor, our economics writer, has written this piece. It's on the front of the magazine this week, as I say. Uh, let's start by looking at the, the differing approach, the slightly differing approach taken by the, the central banks in question here, which are the Fed in the US, the Bank of England, and potentially shortly the ECB as well, because they're all uh, withdrawing slash stopping QE in slightly different ways. Yeah, absolutely. So the first difference is we've got um, these two different kinds of sorts of quantitative tightening. We've got active and passive. And active quantitative tightening is a bit more aggressive. It's where um, central banks actually start selling bonds back to the market, whereas passive quantitative tightening is where central banks just stop reinvesting the proceeds from the bonds that mature and they just let them run off the balance sheet. Um, then we've got the question of timing. So the Bank of England has been pretty proactive. So um, they started passive QT in February last year, which was quite early. And then they actually moved to active quantitative tightening in November. The US started passive quantitative tightening a bit later in June, and they ramped up the scale of it in September. And the ECB haven't even started yet. Um, they announced plans to start passive quantitative tightening in March. And I expect that we'll probably hear a few more details about this um, when the Monetary Policy Committee um, of the ECB meet next week. Um, it is worth noting that I think one thing they've all got in common is a desire to move quite slowly and predictably, um, whether they're doing active or passive quantitative tightening, and to try not to spook markets and take them by surprise. Yes, I mean, that is the, the big question here, really, isn't it? Is what, what impact will QT, as I'm going to start calling it to avoid having to say quantitative tightening each time, uh, what impact will it actually have? You know, I mean, that's a great unknown. You know, we've never uh, been through this scenario before of withdrawing QE. But, you know, it is a withdrawal of liquidity in some form. So there are some suggestions it could put pressure on our markets in some ways. Uh, equally, given we are in the middle of a rate hiking cycle, or we've certainly been through a large number of rate hikes in recent months, it might prove to be just a ripple in, in the overall pond. I mean, this is the big question. I mean, firstly, it looks very likely that QT won't just be the opposite of QE. So QE happened at times of real market stress and it was designed to impact markets, um, whereas QT is hoping to be sort of low drama and going in the background. And it's going to happen at a much smaller scale. Um, for now, the sense amongst analysts seems to be that because central banks have telegraphed the plan so far in advance, um, what we do know so far has probably been priced in. Um, because it's designed to go on in the background, I think it probably looks likely that it will be overshadowed by whatever comes to the economic foreground next year. So um, this year, so we've got kind of stories like falling inflation, um, interest rates finally being cut next year, and then the impact of China reopening. And I think we could find that all of this has a bigger impact on economies and markets than quantitative tightening itself. Um, but it is worth noting that there is still a chance that quantitative tightening could sort of block up the financial plumbing. So we know that in the US, an early attempt at QT had to be abandoned in 2019 um, because overnight borrowing costs soared. And even back then, the Fed was insisting that it would be as boring as watching paint dry and it took us by surprise. Yeah, I mean, uh, on that note, you know, the Bank of England, as you say, it's, it's active, slightly more aggressive approach, even though it has been 
trying to telegraph it. It did have to delay uh, the beginning of that to November, given what happened in markets and UK markets and gilt markets in September and October. Uh, and we did see a little reaction, a very small reaction, perhaps in December in terms of gilt markets as well, given the Bank of England is actively, you know, uh, rolling off these uh, these bond purchases ahead of time, we might say. So there is, there is a risk there, potentially to bond markets of, you know, a lot more supply. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, firstly, the, the Bank of England is still operating in the wake of the gilt market chaos that we saw after the mini budget. Um, as you said, they had to delay selling long end bonds um, back in November. And then when they announced that they were going to resume sales, we did see um, yields kind of spike and markets seemed a bit nervous about that. Um, in theory, the the move to use active QT instead of passive QT shouldn't make too much difference. But there are some analysts saying that um, active tightening will have a bigger impact just because markets have to make room for extra bonds and then they might price yields higher as a result. So I think that's definitely something to keep an eye out on this year. And is this whole process, you know, we, we've called it the return to normality and it's certainly, you know, a step in that direction. Will we get back to that stage? I suppose the question is, you know, interest rates are climbing and, you know, not quite at you know, historic levels, but back to something a bit more normal. Will, will we get to a stage with, with QE where QE is completely gone and, and we're at a, a neutral level again? Or is that almost unachievable at, at this point in affairs? I mean, I think that's a great question. I think so far what we know about the scale of QT is that it looks like it's going to be quite small. Um, economists at the moment think it's very unlikely that central banks will push their balance sheet back to even where they were before the pandemic, let alone before they started QE completely. Um, interestingly, it seems very likely that QT isn't going to carry on once we start seeing interest rate cuts. Um, I've seen that, I mean, that situation I've seen described as be like having your foot on the accelerator and the brake at the same time, which wouldn't make sense. So I think that means that we could see that QT is quite short lived. Interestingly, we've also got some economists saying that QT could actually make a return to QE more likely in the future. Um, so in theory, um, it kind of gives central banks a bit more firepower and lets them reload ready for the next crisis. Um, and the Bank of England haven't ruled out using QE in the future. So we might find that QT is a little break and then we see the resumption of quantitative easing again if central banks think it's necessary sometime in the future. Yeah, it could be a Back to the new normal or whatever yeah. you want to call it. Uh, as I say, that is our cover story this week. We've got a lot more detail in there as usual. So do pick up a copy or have a look online uh, if it takes your fancy. But we're going to finish today with our third section on technology, on US tech. A lot of news flow here uh, as ever. But there has been quite a bit of um, uh, dramatic change in, in some ways in recent weeks and months. Uh, AI is one big thing, which we'll come on to shortly, but we'll start with the job cuts that have been announced by any number of uh, big uh, tech firms in the past few weeks. Uh, Arthur, you have covered both these issues for us. I mean, job cuts, you know, this is the kind of time, perhaps in the cycle, you would expect to see it, certainly after tough years or tougher years for share prices, if not for actual businesses in some cases, which are still functioning well. But I mean, to what extent can we can we take something away from these announcements? If you're a shareholder, you know, you see an announcement of job cuts, do you react positively, as cynical, as cruel as that might sound, or you know, is it a case by case basis? You know, what what are companies trying to achieve with the with these cuts? In a word, you probably do react positively because it doesn't really suggest that the businesses are doing fundamentally badly. Obviously, diff different businesses are performing. Like Microsoft is performing much better than Facebook. Facebook did a lot more job cuts than Microsoft. But I know the reason why these job cuts are happening is because these companies hired so many people in the last four years. Since 2018, both Facebook and Amazon doubled their workforce. Google's was up 58% and Microsoft's was up 38%. And the pandemic growth was insane. Like these companies were growing, grew, grew like 50 or 60%, some of them during the during the pandemic. And they were hired over hired during that period. They're still gonna have way more employees than they had before the pandemic arrived. And in the case of Microsoft, which fired around five percent of its workforce, that's I don't know, you fire five percent of your least productive workers. I don't think that is a massive cause for concern. And in Microsoft's case, if you reports have come out and if you look on social media you can see that a lot of those people who have been removed from the microsoft business actually seem to work in their hollow lens um business division which was virtual reality 
I think Microsoft seems like their contract with the US military for that fell through and it seems and they signed this also signed this partnership with Facebook where Microsoft would provide the software for the Facebook virtual reality headsets and so maybe Microsoft has just thought actually this virtual reality stuff is too speculative and we'll do the software and Facebook can do all the really expensive development on the hardware and those are the kind of decisions I think happen happens at this stage in the cycle when everything's going great you can kind of be more speculative but when interest rates are going up and consumers are getting squeezed Microsoft's worst foreign division was personal computers because um, like people just buying less computers it was down 19 percent and when you have to make tough decisions I think this is just the kind of thing that happens at this point in the cycle but I don't think I'd be too concerned as an investor yeah as you say it does to me seem to be a combination of of yeah people you know looking at their more perhaps speculative arms speculative divisions uh, and you know pairing back there and also that that you know pandemic hiring where some people perhaps Microsoft included thought some of those trends were going to be permanent and they've turned out to be uh, be a bit more cyclical um but I suppose the other interesting thing is you look at the share price reaction in the short term, which doesn't necessarily tell you uh, much about how these these cuts are going to affect businesses in the long term. And it is, it is quite disparate. It does seem maybe some of the more out of favor stocks have reacted better. You know, Salesforce, Meta saw a decent bounce on on news of, of job cuts, again, as, as harsh as that may sound, whereas Amazon, Microsoft didn't really move the dial much. So, so it might be a sign that investors are thinking, these companies recognize a need for change. Uh, Alex, what are your thoughts on how how investors should be reading news of job cuts? Yeah, well, I, I think I wrote about this a little bit last year in a very different case in, in the case of IDS or formerly um, uh, Royal Mail. Um, maybe, I don't know, trying to read between the lines there, maybe in the case of Amazon, the market not reacting a lot is because there's a recognition that so much of Amazon's workforce in a physical sense, is doing a is doing a job which is productive, whereas it's maybe a little harder to see the um, the return on investment from you know from the the more speculative dis- the divisions that you said that you know lots of these big tech firms are involved in. Obviously, there's a huge amount of doubt over Meta's investment in the this unproven concept, the metaverse. Uh, so, any kind of move that management is making to that, that seems shareholder friendly i.e we are focusing on efficiency and productivity is a way of is a way of maybe answering some of those questions um but you know you could take the flip side i sort of i, I probably agree with arthur's point on 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 you know how they how decisions have to be made by management and there are some points in the cycle where everyone kind of kitchen sinks the you know the difficult decisions and uh um and we've seen that in the last few weeks because everyone's got jobs in this sector. But it does also sort of tell us a couple of things that, you know, management, even in these, you know, amazing businesses aren't perfect at allocating capital efficiently, which is bad. Um, uh, and, and you know, at some in some level, growth has perhaps been deprioritized. So, you know, that's also bad. So, um so yeah, I mean, share price reactions on the day on the day, you know, maybe don't read too much into it because, you know, the those, you know, what what is being implied by job cuts is probably only you're only going to be able to see in a, in a year or two, two's time, um, if 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 then, because these are very long cycle investment businesses. So um, yeah, hard one to read, really. I also wonder about Musk and Twitter, where it's he fired fifty percent. Well, I think some people say up to 80% of the workforce and you can question Musk and Twitter, but the, the page still works and they've released some new products. I don't know whether they're good or bad products, but they've done some stuff and the company still functions. And in context of that, a 5% cut at Microsoft or a 10% cut at Meta doesn't look as extreme. And maybe once one person goes and does it in such an extreme way, it seems easier for everyone else then to be like, oh, we'll just cut out some of our least productive workers or slim down the least productive divisions. I mean, it's, it's, and, I was going to say, it's, on that point, it's kind of it's tempting, isn't it, to with with tech businesses to assume that you know you get rid of a former employee, but we've already capitalised that that human that human capital in the business, and that's either can either be automated or we can keep that. So it's almost like the human is disposable, but that's a very is potentially a myopic way of looking at things again because. You need that constant re-innovation, uh, innovation by the 
by the staff, and they're going to have to go, go on a hiring spree at some point. I mean, yeah, I suppose the, the, term, aren't they? the other thing with Twitter is they've cut that many staff, their ad sales are reportedly down, you know, by 30, 40% as well, which admittedly is not necessarily due to having no salespeople, it's more due to uh, advertisers' reaction to the takeover. So that's not a correlation there, but but yeah, maybe that's someone to play out in the next few months as well. But speaking of long-term effects and also speculative technologies perhaps to an extent one area where a lot of money is still being put in is ai and microsoft itself uh, announced a new big investment in open ai this week and the company is really uh, backing the technology to deliver i mean again this is something where to an extent to me it seems that in the past few months all, all the people who were previously uh, or a lot of people who are previously big on crypto are now sort of pivoting seamlessly to saying AI is the future. But there is a use case there, it seems, and you know some of these technologies we've seen online, Chat GPT, which uh, OpenAI makes, uh, you know, you can see it for yourself. You can see um, the the abilities it has. So, Arthur, can you sort of talk us through Microsoft's intentions there, perhaps, and also what it again hopes to get out of it in terms of you know top line, bottom line, ultimately from this kind of investment and from AI in general. Yeah, well, I actually wasn't big on crypto, but I'm quite bullish on AI, so I might fall into a different category. Oh, yeah. It's true, yeah. Certainly not all the people who were bullish on AI were bullish on crypto, but uh, uh, maybe vice versa in some cases. But yeah, go on. Yeah, so Microsoft announced there's a $10 billion investment into OpenAI last week. OpenAI, if you didn't know, is the company that created ChatGPT. They also created DALI2, which was a... ChatGPT is the chatbot you chat to have a conversation it tells you interesting things about the world dali 2 is the prompt to image generator so you write an image you want to see and it creates the image for you and these were released last year and made a massive end of the public consciousness in a way that ai hasn't done before but those programs are all created off the back of microsoft's original investment in open ai in 2019 when they invested a billion dollars into open ai and gave open ai use of its supercomputers. They built a supercomputer. It was one of the five biggest in the world back then. And it was mostly with the purpose of training these models. And the models it trained are the models that gave us chat GPT at the end of last year. Microsoft's now invested another 10 billion into OpenAI and is building another supercomputer it announced with NVIDIA. NVIDIA is the create the GPUs that go into these computers and make AI possible. GPUs use parallel computing rather than linear and are relatively new products and have made this all possible. They announced that they're building the supercomputer in July 2022. So that computer will be turned on these new models and OpenAI will be given access to that as part of the $10 billion deal. And in return, Microsoft's obviously get a big stake in OpenAI, which has been valued at $29 billion. But also Microsoft announced that they would then be using the AI capabilities to improve their own office products, so Word and Excel and PowerPoint. And that sounds enticing to me. I imagine those products will get a lot better, like from a simple, like maybe your spell check on Word will improve a bunch, but also there must be a bunch of people whose jobs, like, I don't know, consultants and things and bankers who must be happy that maybe their slides are going to be created for them. So that's a large proportion of their time is making slide decks for people. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how much, I don't know, the AI technology changes Bing, which is their search engine. And there's been a lot of talk about Google and how Google will respond to that. I think in terms of where the, the question is, is sort of where the value, the value is going to accrue from AI. I think everyone can see that it's going to be incredibly disruptive, but it's not immediately obvious where the value is going to accrue. I think for Microsoft, it could actually be quite, there's no guarantee that this is suddenly going to make Microsoft incredibly wealthy because I don't know whether OpenAI is going to dominate this industry. Maybe Google will have some release some product next year that's way better. Or and you don't. I don't think first mover advantage is necessarily everything. The sort of place that I've looked at in the supply chain that seems like more of a good bet is with the hardware and the picks and shovels. And as I explained, Nvidia, who's the chip designer, produces these GPUs that go into the supercomputers. Nvidia has less competition there and that like, you're going to need those gpus regardless of who's making these ai models so nvidia seems like a good bet for investors 
TSMC who makes those chips also seems like a, another good bet from my perspective. Yeah, as you say, it's often those picks and shovels businesses that, that can really benefit, even if they're not the ones attracting the headlines. Let's finish up our tech talk with a little bit on Google because, or Alphabet, I should say, because the company has faced uh, uh, some more antitrust issues this week. The US is suing it uh, over its ad monopoly. Uh, there's been issues in India, ongoing issues in the EU as well in, in terms of similar concerns from regulators about Google's dominance of uh, advertising markets. Again, the, the question here, I suppose, is is to what extent are these uh, you know, antitrust crackdowns going to have a material impact on the company and to what extent might they peter out into, into fines that uh, Alphabet can easily afford to pay and carry on as usual? Um, we have seen some changes to the way that advertising works in tech in recent um, years, perhaps prompted by regulation to an extent with the likes of Apple and its app store. But Arthur, I don't know if you have a thought on on Google's advertising position and how that might change or might not change. It's difficult to know because, as you said, there's sort of in the past, it's they've only been they've been fined in Europe and they've been fined a few times, and those fines don't have a big material impact on the business. The most extreme case, the worst sort of most extreme would be if a regulator decided to break up Google because it decided it had too big a monopoly. I've asked that question of a few fund managers and stuff, and they seem to not be that concerned about that outcome. It's unlikely that if it did happen, actually, there might be more investor value created when you break up these large companies that do lots of different things. They create more investor value. So in terms of being concerned about it from investment perspective, not too worried. I guess the main concern would be what it means for sort of future future acquisitions and what they can do. And a lot of these tech companies have built their dominance by buying up competitors and stifling innovation through that way. And that's helped create these moats for them. And even if it doesn't, even if they don't get broken up, if there's more pressure on them, there'll be more intervention when they try and acquire other businesses. With Microsoft, you see that with Activision, Blizzard, and you might see it with OpenAI if they, when they try um, in terms of what they can do with them. I think it generally maybe lowers future returns, but putting a putting an obvious value on that is a little bit a little bit trickier. It's I guess not obvious at this stage, and there's a few potential outcomes. And, and and these things obviously take time. There's a a concurrent I think uh, case launched by I think some U.S. states, isn't it? In 2020, I think that was. Uh, which does overlap with this uh, lawsuit in some ways. Uh, you mentioned the the spin-offs and, and obviously breakup will be the nuclear scenario. I think Google did offer to um, divest some businesses, didn't it, in a bid to stop this lawsuit. But uh, I think the DOJ rejected that. But nonetheless, that could be an ultimate outcome. So certainly something to keep an eye on. As you say, the impact is currently unclear, but perhaps you know the fact that this, this suit is now being filed brings us a tiny bit closer to a, a conclusion or at least a, a breakthrough in that in that kind of impasse and in that regulator versus tech struggle that's been going on under the surface for a couple of years now. But that does bring us to the end of today's show. So thank you to everyone today. Thank you to Alex, to Hermione, to Arthur, to Mark, to Julian and to John. And thank you to you for listening. We'll be back next week with another Companies and Markets show.